Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. We, we <laughs> choked on it already. Boy, that didn't take long. Wherever you may be and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to another Not Tell Transmission Talk Tuesday. This is episode number, yes, we're looking, 86. I'm Jeff Welton. We have no guests today. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but uh, it's going to be an interesting thing, to say the least. Uh, as the title says, today's topic, combiners and filters and fun with math. And, and it's funny because this is probably one of the areas where I tend to be a little weaker. So I had to do some self-educating and I'm going to probably rely on y'all to help me out with some of this because looking in the audience, I see some names in here that know a lot more about filters and combiners than I do for sure. Um, so having said that, mandatory housekeeping notes. Okay, first off, we do make these interactive questions, comments, criticisms, concerns, take them all, make them part of the conversation, just enter it into the uh, little window on your uh, control panel, hit the send button underneath, it'll pop up on my screen and we'll make it part of the conversation. Uh, in the preamble, Marco already gave me a shout out. Marco's one of our long time, I, I guess viewer is appropriate. I was gonna say long time listener, but uh, well, hopefully you listen too. Also, if you're not shy and you've got a microphone, there's a little hand raisey icon on the control panel. Feel free to hit that and we'll make you part of the conversation. You'll have to be unmuted on this end and on your end, but uh, it's not like we haven't done this before, 85 times before. Also, if you're an SBE member, Nautel Webinar does qualify for half of a recertification credit under category I or yeah, category I, I got that right. So. Whatever you scribble that those notes down on, make sure to uh, log this one in your little database. All right, moving forward. So the topic, as I said, combiners and filters. As I also said, not my strongest suit, although it's something that I've got a little experience with. I mean, we've been combining amplifiers for a whole lot of years, so the technology is pretty pretty much consistent. Uh, you may remember a couple of weeks ago, we did one on a session on education and mentoring. And uh, there's John giving a shout out from Alaska. Alaska, let's see, John, what is it, 8 a.m. there? Thanks for waking up with me this morning. Uh, I hope, yeah, I, I worded that. Anyway, not even going down that road. But so in our education session, I started it off with uh, this quote. Uh, I grew up reading Louis L'Amour Western, so th this has been one of my favorites for a lot of years. And it's a really cool thing because what you're going to find is as we go through this, other than the terribly rendered uh, sketches that I did myself, most of what I post in here is, is going to be something that I found on the web and, and sources are attributed all the way through. So it is something that you can, uh, you can find an education on pretty quickly. But, uh, you know, again, it's like I've said before, when we're teaching um, RF 101 courses for SBE and things like that, a lot of the job is not telling you all the answers. It's just letting you know what you don't know. So you know what you need to look up or, you know, saying, hey, this is one of those things. And so we start that off. And when we get talking combiners and filters, there are a lot of uh, things. And of course, as I look at that list, I see one thing that I totally forgot to include. So we'll do some of this stuff on the fly as we go. Um, and that should be entertaining. But there are a lot of phrases that, that you hear about. And I know in the advanced questions, for example, uh, William hit me up with one and um, not sure if he's in the audience yet. Nope. So we may, uh, we may hold William uh, responsible for this one, but, uh, but yeah, so, you know, he was talking about CIF versus manifold combiners and, and I had a brain fart and it's like CIF and it's like, okay, I don't know. And, and I'm thinking, uh, well, I was looking at retirement stuff the other day because, you know, someday that may happen. But uh, I was thinking RIF instead of CIF. And, and so, yeah, constant impedance didn't really factor in. Um, Curtis makes a good point here. My mentor taught me very early on to not try to memorize formulas and Google would be your best friend. And so there's the age difference right there because when I was early on, there was no Google, but, but absolutely, we've pretty much got the entire wealth of, the, of, of knowledge in the world 
at our fingertips and, and we just have to remember to use it. And sometimes the biggest challenge with using it is not so much remembering to use it, but uh, learning how to phrase the question because there is an overwhelming amount of information on the internet and about 10% of it's accurate. So, uh, you know, learning what's right and what's not right. By the way, um, in case you haven't noticed looking at the webcam, I'm officially on vacation this week. So you get the Nautel uh, Hawaiian shirt version of Jeff this week. Um, but uh, that's, uh, that's on me. So let's see. Um, well, John's already mentioned he's on a second cup of coffee. So he's already remembered the coffee filter. Um, the other things we will hit as we go. And I don't think there's anything I missed. I'm going to touch the first one right here while we're on this slide. And there is no one stop shop for. Uh, for finding people who are good at any particular thing. If you've got a good contract engineer or consulting engineer, um, the best ones will, will be able to tell you where they're a little short and they will have a Rolodex of people they like for those things. Um, and I mean, if I look down the list of uh, people attending, I, I see, uh, you know, I see Chuck Anderson's in here. Um, I hate to mention too many names because I'm always afraid I'll miss somebody that uh, that I shouldn't miss. But uh, but yeah, I mean, there are a bunch of folks. I mean, West Coast, you got Hatfield Dawson. East Coast, you got uh, Cavell Mertz. And uh, shout out to Cavell Mertz, if for no other reason than the uh, awesome resource that is FCCinfo.com. I mean, if you are in a in a situation where you're constantly trying to look up what's out there for whatever, then uh, that, that's a great resource. All right. Um, so I guess the best answer to the first one is if you've got a project going on, reach out to somebody you do trust. And it could be me, could be a consultant, could be anybody and uh, ask them who, who they like. And uh, you know, like, like with doctors, get a second opinion, get a couple of them. Uh, let's see, Marco says 10% sounds a bit hot. Yeah, not not a lie there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, Dan's asking if uh, you can, oh, so Dan wants to know if Nautel sells these shirts with the Nautel logo on them. I am going to do something I try not to do live and mess with the camera. And you'll see that this one does have the Nautel logo on it. All right. This is why we don't mess with the camera. There's a reason I don't do video for a living. There we go, good enough. All right, so um, Dan also says coffee filter is tied for number one position. Air filters run side by side, absolutely. Uh, so moving forward, we're going to start with some elementary stuff. I mean, when you're talking filters as a rule, and, and it doesn't matter, AM, FM, TV, shortwave, microwave, they're all the same in some regards. You've got capacitance and inductance and resistance. I mean, you know, the, the fundamental building blocks. And, and we've got Ohm's law, e equals I times R. We all somewhat know that. Um, you know, and of course, you know, various levels of familiarity depending on what you do. But uh, when you look at any circuit, and now in AM and shortwave, these components are going to be discrete. You're going to have a capacitor or an inductor. When you get into FM and TV, that uh, capacitor may just be two chunks of aluminum side by side, one grounded, one not. Um, the length of the aluminum adds inductance at high frequencies. So it could be an LC circuit, you know, uh, rather than having discrete components. So what I tried to hit with was the, I guess the things that I think are a little more critical when we're talking about uh, filters and combiners and tau, the, the time constant is the big one. And uh, as, I, as it says here, I mean, basically it's the, the rate at which a capacitor or inductor stores or releases energy in the form of voltage or current. Um, that's my really complicated version of it. But if you're feeding this uh, capacitor with DC, it'll store energy. And um, as it, it's an exponential curve, as you can see there. The cool thing is if you've got a load resistor or a series resistor, as you change resistance, you will change that curve. Um, you will either flatten it out or make it steeper. 
And uh, that's something kind of critical to remember as we get along. And, and that's impacting something called Q, the quality factor, which we'll also touch later on, which directly impacts the bandwidth if we're looking at a, a pass or a reject filter. And so we'll talk about those as well. So like I said, whether we've got a capacitor storing energy and as that capacitor is it uh, stores voltage, the voltage across it goes up. So the voltage across the load resistor is gonna go down. So as the frequency or as the time constant goes up, well, of course, time is the inverse of frequency. So depending if we're starting to charge and discharge, then we'll have a, a, a cutoff frequency or frequency at which that thing just won't pass energy. And that, or in, in this case, sorry, with a capacitor is you get to higher frequencies, it passes them better and blocks the lower frequencies. So this would be an example of a really, really rudimentary high pass filter. And if you look at the time constant determined by resistance and capacitance, that's about the point where you'll get enough voltage developed across the, the load resistor to make it worth using. So, you know, and again, you'll notice, like I said, resources. I've got links all through here. They're all from different places. So some will be more useful than others to you. You know, th these are the ones that happen to catch my eye and uh, just sort of hitting this. Now, obviously I've got a little bit of background knowledge. I mean, I hope. But uh, Lord knows something had to rub off after enough years. <laughs> but uh, so just to create a little bit of a test for myself, I started putting this slide deck together at about 11 p.m. last night. So what you're seeing is quite literally, uh, I mean, the hodgepodge stored up here, but the reminders that I uh, came up with as, uh, and the resources I found in the process of uh, illustrating them. So whether you put the capacitor in series or in parallel will also determine whether you've got a high pass filter or in this case, a low pass filter, because as the uh, capacitor is um, charging or, or becoming more uh, a lower impedance to the higher frequencies, then you'll develop more of the voltage across your series resistor, your input resistor than across your load. Um, the, uh, Right hand side shows, and, and this was what I was talking about earlier with the uh, resistor value or the load resistance, or in this case, the series resistance on the input, um, you can impact the uh, time constant significantly and affect the, uh, the, I guess, the cutoff rate. And as you can see, like if you were taking the first one, that, that blue dash, you've got a pretty steep shoulder there, pretty steep curve, and it will, uh, it will uh, really cut off sharply. Now, if you're creating a bandpass filter and you've got uh, something that you want to get rid of fairly close in, those steep shoulders are a good thing. The challenge is that typically, because what goes up must come down, you're going to have a fairly narrow bandwidth on a filter like that. And that can have an impact. And one of the early questions was, how do we look at HD radio? And the funny thing is, and this is one of those really loaded sort of things. Um, the higher the cutoff or, or the, the sharper the uh, shoulders, uh, the more dB per octave you uh, drop, then the, um, the narrower the bandwidth will be. And, and the thing I get at is if we were designing stuff all along with good bandwidth for our conventional analog signal, and this is where I was going with this, then it would pass an HD signal just fine. Uh, the challenge becomes, especially on AM, we, we've crammed a lot of stuff in there and less attention's been paid to the antenna system and bandwidth and phase rotation over the decades. And uh, so HD can be a little more concerning. You do, HD does require a wider bandwidth than analog to function. Now, there's function and there's function well. I mean, uh, I think it was, uh, I'm gonna get it wrong because I get it wrong every time. I think it was Carl Smith wrote the paper in the 50s on uh, optimizing directional uh, AM tuning networks. 
And uh, so I, I've always said my choice is Carl Smith and Carl Jones. They're, they're both incredible engineers. And like I said, I'll get it wrong every time. So um, somebody can correct me in the comments and I'll, uh, I'll bring out the right answer. But, uh, but that paper, again, from 1958, was talking about how to properly get the bandwidth and phase orientation out of an AM directional. And we've just ignored it for so many years. Well, then IBOC came along and IBOC requires it to actually work. I mean, you just don't get the coverage out of a poorly set up antenna system. So this is the kind of stuff that, uh, to answer the question in the preamble, um, talk about HD. HD, the bandwidth isn't an option. You know, with analog, if you have narrow bandwidth, it's gonna sound a little muffled and it's not gonna have as much high end or it's gonna have some distortion or the multipath will be up or, 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 but for the most part, it will still function. Um, with HD, you don't have that. Uh, you either got it or you don't got it. So it, this is the bandwidth this is something to pay attention to. Um, Ray in the comments mentions that. Let me scroll up a little just so I can get it all. Here we go. Microwave Mission Wizard is a great tool for design and filters, hybrid combiners, very intuitive, many wizards, a limited version. So, um, Ed, oh, and I forgot to give my shout out. Ed, I'm sorry about that, but uh, Mr. Disembodied Voice, Ed Sylvester in the background, uh, making sure that everything works properly. And uh, I believe that, um, so Ed has um, got, um, the ability to throw the link that Ray put in here, uh, www.mician.com into chat so you all can see it. Um, let's see, John mentions that back in the AM stereo days, we had to spend time fixing AM antennas. And, and this is really critical. This is a good point. AM stereo, anybody remembers that way back in the, well, way back in the day, there's still folks broadcasting it. We still make transmitters that'll run it. but. Uh, AM stereo was another one where if your antenna system didn't have the bandwidth, the performance went straight to hell. So yeah, exactly. We, you know, because again, you've got an amplitude modulated component and a phase modulated component. Um, I am going to, Ray, if you have a microphone available, I'm going to unmute you and I'm going to get you to tell me a little bit about this uh, microwave, uh, mic the, the shoot, um, the uh, filter design uh, software. And uh, let's see, so you're unmuted on my end. You'll have to unmute on your end as well. And I'll see you go green. There you are, you're green. Hi, right, Jeff. Uh, no, um, I consider myself an amateur filter designer. We've got people, PhD people that are really, really good, but uh, this tool is so uh, easy to use. It's drag and drop, you drag elements in, it's got wizards. You can do a diplexer, I did one last week and maybe a couple of hours, I guess, and you can export it into HFSS or whatever, but it's the accuracy is great. It, it's a, it was a game changer as far as you can do hybrids filters. Um, and I would really recommend it if anybody wants to, you know, actually design these things, uh, cause you don't have to be a PhD, uh, filter designer to do this. Uh, and, uh, mm -hmm. it's adequate for, you know, probably, 80%, 90% of the stuff we have to do. So uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful, it's drag and drop. Um, it generates the geometry. You can look at it. You can export cool. it. Does it uh, give you plots of like like bandwidth and um, return oh, yeah. off, things like that? So you, you can look at all that stuff. So. You got, you got, it's a pretty high end band and you can export it uh, to solid works and you can actually, uh, you know, have uh, the mechanical folks actually fabricate it from that. So. Very cool. Um, All right. Well, I think for somebody that's not a, you know, a filter designer, I've, I've got, we've got filter designers <laughs> who've been doing this for 40 years and are really smart and I can't compete with that, but you know, 80, 90% mm -hmm. of the time I can, I can do something that's, that's good enough with it. So right. it's a lot well, easier. And the, the other advantage is something like this, and we'll talk about it in a bit, but like you look at, at a situation where you've got say a, a translator being combined with a, a bigger transmitter and you need to know the uh, the return loss or the isolation between the ports just so you can figure out whether you need to add additional whether three pole filter or four pole filter to uh, keep you from uh, overwhelming your translator with the big signal. 
Yeah, you can add that. If you've got measured data, you, you can put that as a black box reflection because, yeah, the reflections will uh, degrade the uh, isolation. Uh, but, uh, right. So, and, and I mean, pretty much every manufacturer, I mean, I can tell you for most of what we build these days, the return loss is 20 dB. So 1% of what goes out is coming back. And, uh, you know, that 1%, uh, 0.1%. Sorry about that. My math failed me. But, but yeah, that, that's a, a great point. Thanks, Ray. Appreciate that. Okay, moving on. Let's see here. Where was I? Um, so time constant is crucial. Um, the uh, say, and, and yeah, there's the uh, Wikipedia answer. Like I said, this entire session is a series of uh, things that I found on the internet, which is it's questionable at best. Uh, I'll be the one to tell you that Wikipedia and I have a love-hate relationship. There are things that I have found on it that I can uh, prove and are 100% verifiable. There are things on it where I tend to be a little more cautious, I guess. But then when we get to the point where we're adding inductors, I'm going to back up a little. So inductors, and I, I did show the time constant. The other thing you'll remember is that uh, so if you've got R over L, 2 pi FL, et cetera, and so on, um, you can uh, re you may remember that the formulas for uh, calculating uh, inductive and capacitive reactants are, are similar, 1 over 2 pi FC and uh, 2 pi FL, um, not inversed for inductors, inversed for, again, whether it stores or releases energy. But um, this is uh, a great sort of, I guess, refresher, if you will. It, it was for me because this is math that I don't play with on a daily basis. You know, you typically don't need to know how to design a filter to uh, to repair a, a blown up one. But uh, it, it's good to have the background, especially if you're looking at combining signals or I, I give you a prime example. The one call I get a lot is uh, we're putting this translator on the tower with this class C. And, uh, you know, is that going to be okay? And there are a lot of things you need to know. You need to know the isolation between the two antennas. How far apart are they? You need to reach out to, uh, you know, you reach out to somebody like Bill Harland at ERI or, or one, uh, Dale over at uh, Shively, which, uh, shout out, Shively is now owned by American Amplifier Tech, uh, just for what it's worth. So, uh, so Dale's uh, still with them, and uh, that's kind of cool. But anyway, um, reach out to one of those guys and they'll be able to give you an idea based on the, the physical spacing of the antennas on the tower, what the isolation between the two is. So as I mentioned earlier, 20 dB is the return loss in our transmitters. Well, if you've got 40 dB isolation between two antennas, at that point, then you, you can quite literally calculate the uh, amount of uh, power from that class C because you know, 10 dB is one decimal place, 20 dB is two decimal places, 60 dB is six decimal points. So that 100,000 watt is putting about one watt back into the output of that translator. Not going to typically be significant. Now, I, I emphasize typically because it'll depend on what your translator transmitter is as well, of course. But again, this is, this is math. This is numbers. This is something that we can... Uh, calculate and uh, be reasonably confident that our results are going to be repeatable. And, and that's really what we're looking at. Uh, I got somebody else in the audience and I haven't been looking to see if he's paying attention. So I'm, I'm giving him the little time. This is the point where everybody who wasn't paying attention is uh, all of a sudden uh, running over and uh, just making a hundred percent sure that now they are paying attention. Uh, Dan Gunter, I'm unmuting you. So if you want to open up, because uh, I, I know I'm um, talking return loss and uh, isolation between uh, transmitters can uh, somebody sometimes be one of those situations that you run into a lot uh, just doing uh, field work. And uh, so, Dan, you're going to have to unmute yourself, but you've been unmuted on this end, and uh, we'll see if Dan's actually gone for a coffee or not. Um, so we, we may end up hitting him up later, too. But uh, I'll leave him up there while we shoot forward instead of uh, spending too much time. So Jeff, uh, it's Ed. Uh, Dan just yeah. uh, wrote that he doesn't have a mic today. Uh, go figure. All right. Um, and anyway, carrying on. So when you add inductors and capacitors, then again, you've got the ability to um, store and release energy. 
you've got a bandwidth. Uh, remembering, as I mentioned, and we'll see it again in a little bit, that the Q, the, uh, the quality factor, determines what the bandwidth is. And one of the biggest uh, characterizers or, or one of the biggest things that, uh, that affect Q is um, resistance, so circuit resistance. And, uh, you know, you can, especially on an AM, you can add a little resistance to a, a network and increase the bandwidth. Now, as you do that, of course, you've got loss across the resistor. So everything is a trade-off. Um, the folks that have done AM stereo, and we were talking about it earlier, will remember that between day pattern and night pattern, you could optimize for either, but it was almost impossible for optimizing for both. So you either pick the one that had the most amount of listeners or you pick the average between the two. So it, uh, quote unquote, sucked equally on both modes. And... Uh, you know, that's uh, just an example. And when you get a filter that is designed by somebody else, you are going to be, I won't say limited by, I guess, constrained. You've got to work in the constraints of what you've got to play with. But uh, sometimes there are things that can be done. Um, the reason, again, we bring in bandwidth and uh, let's see, John Van Milligan is there and mentions that HD is even wider than the 20 megahertz. Well, now, John, is that 20 megahertz or 20 millihertz? Because uh, that's a small M. Uh, tell you what, I'm going to unmute you then, since Dan can't, uh, can't talk. You, uh, you became my new, um, my new victim for the moment. But uh, what do they say? Uh, the person that puts up their hand gets to... Uh, now, of course, this is where uh, Don, John tells me he doesn't have a mic either. Nope, I see him green. Uh, so tell me about that. What are you talking about? All right, John, you're unmuted, but you're not uh, making noise. We're batting a 1,000 for bringing people in today, folks. This is uh, not... Uh, not my best uh, effort in that regard. So, okay, well, John, if you um, just ping me in the um, comments, if you figure out what's going on with the mic or, or just shout out when you do figure it out and we'll see if it uh, becomes audible because right now we cannot. How's this Here. mic? Oh, there, that one's good. Okay, that's, that's not the one that's not as good, um, but it works. Yeah, no, I, the letters are wrong. It's 20 kilohertz uh, bandwidth we had to deal with for AM stereo. Yes. Um, and then 30 kilohertz you have to deal with for HD. So Well, uh, and so I'll quantify that a bit because AM stereo at plus and minus 10 kilohertz, if you cut it off that sharp, it still sounded pretty not as off, pretty muddy. Right. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, you're right. Uh, AMHD, the spec is 1.4 to 1 at plus or minus 15 kilohertz for the SWR. Yeah. And uh, I'm here to tell you that the better you make that, the further it'll go. And um, I, I tell the story, and, and I've probably told this story here before, so if I have, well, I'll apologize in advance, but I won't stop. Um, we had, uh, I, I did two installations for a company that's not doing uh, radio at all anymore, but, uh, but did in the day. And uh, one of them was a four tower parallelogram. And on that one, the bandwidth was so wide that if you tried to look at the impedance sweep, um, you basically saw dot and you had to go to times 10 magnification on a network analyzer to see anything other than a dot. It was that flat. And uh, on that one, in the main lobe, the HD outran the analog. When you lost the HD, the analog was already un un unintelligible. Now, same company had another a six tower inline, uh, that, as I recall. And uh, that one, the bandwidth was so narrow that at uh, plus 15, at one of the 15 kilohertz sidebands, it was a, like a 5.9 to a 6 SWR. And uh, Ron Rackley himself, rest his soul, said that he goes, I can make this do HD. We we'll just take that tower down. We'll put two more towers up over there and we'll move that tower about 100 feet to the left. And, uh, you know, a million dollars, we can get the bandwidth up there enough to do HD. Um, but on that one, they opted not to. 
because, well, that's a million dollars for a five kilowatt AM is a big chunk of change. But uh, they um, in in the HD and hybrid HD mode, you could it, it radiated better in the dummy load in some cases. So yeah, it, it's very very much load consistent. It's like I tell people, and, and this is true whether you're talking AM, FM, TV. I mean, your antenna is like the speakers on your stereo system, and you can add the best Macintosh amplifier and oxygen free cables and tuned everything and if you're running it into a set of ten dollar walmart speakers it's still going to sound like crap you know and, and the same is true of radio if you're broadcasting into a less than optimal antenna you're going to get less than optimal results that could show up as a decreased range it could show up as decreased audio performance it could show up as multi-path which translates to decreased range could show up as MER for DTV or HD radio, which again, decreased coverage. So there are you know, a lot of things to look at. We're not building a transmitter, like the transmitter doesn't control at all. It's the entire system. And so you've got to have that mic to antenna picture in your head when you start to play with this stuff. So we've mentioned the Q factor several times, and uh, this is, probably as good a description of the um, Q as I've found. Now, for what it's worth, like on our AMs, the Q is relatively low in the order of two. And, and I mean, those are, are tuned circuits. Uh, I'll give you an example of a, an electrically short whip antenna that I've encountered that's naturally resonant at about five megahertz. And, um, it's loaded to uh, bring it down to make it uh, operable at uh, AM frequencies, but its Q is you get to the low end of the band is, is pushing 300. Well, on that one, you don't have enough bandwidth to hardly run audio through it. Great for voice. I wouldn't want to feed music. So again, know the Q of what you're dealing with. And, and especially on AM, it will, uh, it will impact your, uh, your signal a lot, but also HD. Uh, if you've got a situation where you're combining two stations and they're very close in frequency, say second or third adjacent, you're going to need some pretty sharp Q or, or some pretty high Q, some sharp shoulders, some tight cutoff, you know, in order to keep them from interfering with each other. So sometimes we have to make the trade off, but it, it is something to really, really pay attention to. Um, See, I haven't missed anything critical in the comments. Good. So back to our word salad. And uh, th that, in a nutshell, is the, the very, very uh, brief and dirty thing about the filters. But we, we've got the Q. We've got the uh, cutoff frequency. Um, return loss and insertion loss are another thing that are really critical not just for filters, for combiners. Uh, insertion loss we talk about in almost everything. And I mean, insertion loss is what it sounds like. How much do I impact my uh, transmitted power by putting this thing in the circuit? And um, that's, uh, that, that's something that, um, you know, we need to be aware of. In a lot of cases, that insertion loss might be, well, for an example, a connector or an elbow, it might be fractions of a dB. But enough fractions of a dB, they add up. So, you know, again, something to pay attention to. Um, when you're inserting a filter, there will be some insertion loss. And uh, by the same token, a combiner. And that will impact the... Uh, input power to the antenna, which of course directly in the case of FM and TV will uh, impact the ERP. So you need to know what the loss is for anything you're putting in. Return loss is just basically how much is going out and how much of that's coming back. And as I said, most of ours are uh, 20 dB, so you point, uh, point zero 0.01 of, uh, so, you know, again, something to uh, just keep in the back of your head. And uh, the, the reason that gets important is because, as I said earlier, if I've got two channels coming together, and I think this is where 
Steve is asking. Yep, Steve's asking this question. Steve says he's a combiner newbie. And Steve, look, when it comes to combining amplifiers in a transmitter, got you covered. When it comes to combining transmitters in a station at different frequencies, you're not the only newbie here. So I, I did a lot of learning, and uh, th this was one of those uh, things that uh, that I um, kind of had to uh, sort of pick up on the fly. And uh, I may uh, may grab him early or there. Let's see. We'll hold off on that for a second. But um, so Steve's question was: In a combiner network, what keeps one station signal from getting into the other station's transmitter? And that is a very good way of, um, it's a good question. And this comes back to two things. And one is the return loss for the specific transmitters. That will add directly to the isolation between the input ports on your combiner, whatever that may be. And I mean, it may be that you're putting two antennas on the same tower with each transmitter feeding and the physical space between the antennas or the way they're located on the tower is uh, creates the isolation. But that isolation expressed in dB plus the return loss tells you how much of that signal will get back to this transmitter. Then again, like I said, you can do the math. So if uh, my transmitter's got 20 dB return loss and uh, I'm putting in a um, an ERI combiner with 40 or 50 dB isolation between the input ports, and it will vary depending on the frequencies the combiner is designed for, as well as the combiner design itself. But knowing that uh, isolation between the input ports, as well as the return loss of the specific transmitter, will let you know exactly what level of power in dB is coming back. So again, if one of the inputs is, say, 20,000 watts, and I've got uh, 40 dB of isolation, well, that's four decimal places. If I've got 20 dB of return loss, that's two more decimal places. So that's a very short amount of power, short, a little bit of power getting back in. Um, in some situations, if you've got a tight spacing with very little isolation between frequencies, and the worst I've seen is 20 dB, but... Uh, that, that certainly wasn't an ERI. Um, that, that was a different company who will remain nameless. But uh, if you've got very little isolation, we'll say I'm running 10 kilowatts into one and I've only got 20 dB of isolation, that's 100 watts coming back. Now, 20 dB of return loss, that should still only be one watt getting to the final of my translator transmitter as an example. But that one watt may be an issue. So yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it it very much is something you need to pay attention to. Um, let's see, Bill Harland, you're in the audience. I don't know if you've got a microphone. If you do, you're unmuted on my end um, because I, you you I know can speak way better to isolation than I can. You got me. Yeah, I got you. You're loud and clear. So right. for the folks that don't know, Bill's with ERI. You've been there a lot of years now. Yeah, I've been here over 20 years. Um, yeah. Basically, our, our design standard internally is we count on the filter to add 40 dB of isolation. And what's really happening in a, in a combiner is if you're talking about a T combiner or a manifold combiner or what we call a branch combiner, uh, the, the actual combining is occurring in the coaxial T's that are at the output of the filter. And the purpose of the filter, and, and if you were to combine two transmitters, that's all you need. You could do it with just coax. The problem is, if you do it with just coax, you'll have the signals from each transmitter going through the amplifier of the other transmitter, and you'll end up with the IM products. Right. And so when you have transmitter powers over 5 kilowatts, uh, you're required to be down 80 dB outside of 600 kilohertz from your signal. And if you're below five kilowatts, there's the formula and the rules where you do those do those calculations. So if you're talking about a translator or a much lower power transmitter, uh, a derated class C1 or C3 that's on a mountain where you're only running 250 or 500 watts, then it's a completely dairy. I mean, you need to run the formula to see what kind of IM threshold you have to maintain. Uh, so 
I mean, that's our internal thing. I mean, if you want the rough rule of thumb, if you've got uh, two megahertz or more of separation between the two uh, frequencies you're trying to combine or protect from, you need a three pole filter. If mm -hmm. you're closer than that, you need a four pole filter. And if you're 1.2 megahertz or closer, we recommend adding non-adjacent coupling. And non-adjacent coupling in a four, uh, four tank filter, all that does is add a, a feedback loop between the first can and the last can. And that lets you put a notch right at the band edge. And by doing that, you increase the isolation. And that allows you to open the filter up and improve the uh, group delay performance, which is critical if you're talking about HD radio. And that's something actually that I had not put up in my little list, but but group delay is effectively quite literally the time it takes a signal to get from the goes into to the goes outer, right? Right. And, and so, yeah. And the ubiquity standard says you've got to maintain a group delay variation of 600 nanoseconds or less. And non-adjacent uh -oh. coupling helps you to do that. Right. And and the other thing to remember, too, is that between the lower end of the passband and the upper end of that passband, that group delay may not be constant. It, it may be yeah. slightly different from one part to another. And, and for that, you've got what are they called? S21 curves. Is that what uh, the, yeah. the right thing I'm remembering? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. That's what they're measuring. And that's what's in the data file. And uh, Fortunately, I have a bunch of people around here who take that stuff and do that stuff much quicker than me. That's and that's what I say. Um, and and I know for us uh, because we can pre pre distort, I guess the the radiated signal mm -hmm. to compensate for group delay in a combiner. We we do some level of group delay correction for HD automatically, but for, for analog signals, if, if you're into a combiner situation and group delay is a concern, then then we can distort and I know we've gone to 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 your folks before to get the S21 curves to do that. So absolutely, that, yeah. And uh, cool. if you ever want that information provided with your filter, we can do that. So let's see. Um, Steve had also asked, safe to assume that the return loss is directed to the reject load, and that's to some extent, yeah. But a lot of times, I mean, again, we're only talking a water two. Usually, it's just dissipated as heat, correct? Yeah, that's, uh, we just count out on its heat. Um, but if you are in a constant impedance system, much of that will go back, any return signal will go back to the balance, what I call the system balanced load at the broad port. And, and that's a, another question that somebody had asked in the preamble. What's the primary difference between a CIF or a constant impedance load versus a, a conventional branch or manifold combiner? When you're talking about a, a branch or manifold combiner, they're less expensive because you're you're they're reflective filters, so you only have a single bank of uh, bandpass filters. Uh, in the old days, they actually used to do this stuff with notch filters, so uh, that was a pretty marginal way to do it, but they did make it work. Mm -hmm. um, so the uh, the problem with a bandpass filter is any any energy out of band energy from your transmitter that uh, hits the input to the filter that's reflected back. Uh, if it hits your uh, uh, re reflected power meter at the wrong angle, it can fool your transmitter into thinking there's a VSWR. And that's why whenever you put in a reflective filter, you should always make sure you have some place where you can add a trombone, a transmission line to move those that uh, out of band energy uh, to a vector where it won't bother, bother the output. Um, and then, of course, the uh, the distances in the, in the coaxial combining T's, whether it's uh, uh, one or two or two or three transmitters and filter banks, is a critical distance. So the combiner has to be reassembled and occupy the footprint that it was designed and put together to do. And that's, an impedance fit. yeah. Sorry, I'm going to say that's a really good point, though. I ran into one with uh, combined uh, 10 kilowatt transmitters once where we discovered we had a, a piece of Teflon in one of the filters making a capacitor that was a little thinner than it should have been. We found out when it arced. And when we repaired it, the other one started arcing. And just after we got them both fixed, then uh, things started shutting down with SWR. And I just grabbed the tape measure, set it to half a wavelength, and just arm over arm with this tape measure 
discovering that uh, the input to the combiner was exactly uh, a, a multiple of half wavelengths away, and there was a nice little pile of soot at the input of the, not ERI, by the way, but at the input of the combiner. So that they'd had a failure there, which showed us our weak spots. Yeah. Uh, with a constant impedance, oh, the other thing with a, a, a reflector, any kind of T combiner or, or a manifold combiner, is once you put the system together, if you want to change it uh, uh, and add somebody else, you, you have to tear the whole thing apart and start over. Mm -hmm. uh, usually when we receive a request like that, we will use a constant impedance filter at the T combiner or manifold combiner output to add the additional signal. And therein you get to the primary advantage of a, a constant impedance filter. One, they are more expensive because you have two banks of filters. And then the filters are installed with a hybrid ring. So you have a 3 dB hybrid at the input and a 3 dB hybrid at the output. And uh, so you can put those combiner modules anywhere you want. Uh, down in Atlanta, there's a system where they have each combiner module in the transmitter room and the transmission lines between the filter banks are run outside the building and back into each room. Uh, or you can put them all together uh, in a single space. Uh, it's generally a good idea to put them together uh, in frequency order, uh, either high to low or low to high. Uh, and then if you need to add somebody, you can, uh, in some cases, get away with putting them on the beginning or the end, or you can move the filters around and, and uh, add them in frequency order, which would give you the best performance. Um, hmm. And then, of course, a constant impedance filter. This is less of a problem with solid state transmitters than it than it is with a tube type transmitter. But you've got a uh, an input hybrid with uh, the narrow band input and uh, the other ports terminated with a reject load. So it's always a 50 J ohm uh, J zero uh, input, and the transmitter is always happy. Yep. Yeah. And, and I mean, that's uh, one of the things I was mentioning earlier. I know typically for us, pretty much all of our boxes, as I said, have about a 20 dB turnaround loss or, mm -hmm. or return loss rather. Whereas with two brigs, that could vary drastically from one make to another. Yeah. So excellent. Thanks, Bill. I really appreciate that. Uh, and, and Bill's been on a few of these. So folks, Bill Harland, as I said, been uh, your sales manager, director of sales. Uh, You've been with ERI so long, it's just Bill from ERI to me, but uh, but what is your... I, I, I'm just the marketing dude. I'm the VP of marketing here, but I most of most of what I do is the... I, I run all the applications engineering. Oh, very cool. So, and so anyway. if you get a big system proposal, Bill did that. Very, very good to know. Well, thanks, and I appreciate your time. All right. Now, so... This was uh, one of the things we were talking about was the hybrid combiners, and this is a uh, 3dB hybrid. And uh, funny thing is, this was uh, swiped from Amphenol, who you may remember as being connectors. This is just a, a cheesy little uh, BNC uh, combiner that they uh, have developed. I say developed, I mean a 3dB hybrid is a 3dB hybrid. But uh, two signals go in, one signal comes out, it's, uh, and it shows the phase shifts going in. And then the isolated port is your, uh, your I guess, uh, reject load where uh, any mismatch power ends up. So that is fairly simple and easy to plot. Uh, as Bill mentioned, it's also prone to uh, generating a lot of uh, inter, uh, interference between the two signals. So th there's not a lot of isolation. So when we do stuff like that, we do tend to add filtering. And this is an example of the power module in one of our current transmitters where you've got four amplifiers. And each of the, let me get the highlighter here just because this is the point where I've got to show things. But each of these little uh, little rectangles, if you will, is a coaxial, uh, just a link to coax that's uh, set to a specific wavelength to act as a, uh, as a filter. And... Uh, that's uh, one of the things, again, that you can do with FM over AM that, uh, that you know, in AM that would require specific components. But so we can combine two amplifiers that way 
with a little bit of filtering and then do a hybrid for the two blocks of two to get a single output with an internal reject load. And so this is a four-way combiner, you know, in, in a nutshell. Now, this is done obviously at much lower powers. I mean, these are 750 watt amplifiers, as I recall. So, you know, we're not talking like 20 kilowatt transmitters by any stretch, but, uh, but it just gives you an idea of the sort of things that, uh, that you can do. And I mean, a lot of this stuff is done like the, uh, the, the, the little blocks, if you look in the output of one of our transmitters, or if you happen to be at our users group in NAB and got one of our uh, combiner t-shirts, um, a lot of that stuff is just done with track on a board. As I said, for FM, for TV, um, well, high, high frequency anyway, um, VHF frequencies, when you run a track on a circuit board, if you double it back on itself, you've made a capacitor. If you uh, make it longer, you've made a bigger inductor. So a lot of it is just done by routing track on a circuit board. Um, let's see. John mentions in the old days of TV, we just had a hybrid combiner, visual in one, oral in the other, and the outputs to the 90 degree outputs into the Batwing antenna. And, and exactly. So, you know, you can uh, use it in TV to put the audio on the video. Uh, in radio, you might be using it to combine two transmitters. I've run into situations where combining was done with phased antennas and they use um, phased match coax. Like we specifically had to phase match the coax between two transmitters and they were combined in space off the antennas. Uh, I've seen that done a couple of times. Where that gets entertaining is if the uh, tower crew puts one of the antennas in upside down and your net result is zero. Um, and I've seen that once also, or twice. Uh, let's see, Curtis had asked earlier if there's any chance of getting a list of the websites I referenced along with the notification that the webinar is uploaded. And the system is pretty automated so that would have to be a manual uh, process, Curtis, but certainly if anybody wants a list of the websites, rather than just uh, going to the, the archive version on YouTube and, and trying to copy them down or screenshot them one at a time, then let me know. I'm more than happy to create an email with a list of the links in it. I, I sure don't mind doing that. But but certainly send me an email, jwelton at notel.com. That's J-W-E-L-T-O-N at notel.com. And uh, I'm glad my uh, name wasn't like Jingo or Jacob Hammersmith or anything, but uh, but yeah, um, send me an email. Let me know if you want want anything like that, and I'm more than happy to provide it. All right. Uh, one other note that I had forgotten earlier that uh, Ray had mentioned that the NAB Engineering Handbook and the SBE Engineering Handbook both have uh, good chapters on combining combining transmitters. So uh, that is another good thing to know. All right, moving on. I think we're getting near the end. Uh, we're hitting close to the top of the hour where I didn't have a, uh, a guest host on. It was uh, a little challenging to uh, estimate the time. So this may be one of the very few sessions where we finish early as opposed to even on time or, or 15 minutes late. Um, that depends on y'all. But I just want to go back into AM. I mentioned we use discrete components. So this goes way, way back. This is the combiner out of one of our AMFET series. Uh, this is a 10 kilowatt AM. And this is just a hardcore series combiner. Each uh, power amp or power block has got its own little output transformer. And then you've got one big honking secondary with a winding or windings off of each of those output transformers. Downside is if you remove any of those inputs while the transmitter's running, it generates a massive voltage on the open circuit and there's sparks and flames and bad things. So anytime you've got a series combiner, you absolutely cannot run it. It's not that you just can't remove a module with it turned on, you can't run it with a module on unless you've got something in to bridge that, uh, that missing transformer. And like on the old Amfets, we provided a, uh, a dummy PA, we called it, with, uh, I think it was a capacitor across, just to provide something to bridge that gap. So you, you didn't have the open circuit. Um, the reason I bring that in is because some combiners 
uh, some designs are a little fussier about that than others. And if you do pull like a star combiner as an example, another method we use had 60 degrees of isolation. But if you transition from connected to disconnected without uh, dropping it, in our case, a shorting relay across it, uh, I think Gates error, you shut down the transmitter and put a little patch cord across it and then turn it back on. So it doesn't matter which way you do it, but if you didn't do something to uh, bridge that gap, then again, you could develop a really high impedance and a high impedance translates to a high voltage and high voltage, as we all know, translates to arcs and sparks and uh, bad things happening. So that's the kind of stuff that you also need to be aware of. With FM and, and the stuff we were talking about with Bill, much less a concern if you have an open port. Uh, and, and again, talk to your, your manufacturer, but for the most part, that's not going to be a situation like it would be on, a, on an AM system like that. So that, that's just the uh, mandatory safety comment. Uh, don't just willy-nilly unplug stuff until you know what willy-nilly unplugging stuff will absolutely do. All right, on that note, I think we're going to wrap it up unless anybody throws anything else at me in the questions. I think we hit them all as we go. Oh, one thing, let me get back before we shut the door on this. Um, going back. So the two things that I didn't touch, well, we were talking mostly about band pass filters. I mean, the only difference between a pass filter and a notch filter is, uh, again, whether you're series or parallel and how you turn it, where, where you run the uh, overlap between going signal going through and signal not going through. Um, we did not talk about shorting stubs, and that is something that uh, if you hit um, our website, notel.com, on the right-hand side of the page, there'll be a tab for support. If you click on that, then on the headers, you'll get a tab for uh, technical resources. And in that list, there's one called Tips and Tricks, which is a list of all the articles I've written for the Waves newsletter for several years. Um, one of the ones in there is how to build a, a quarter wave stub. And, and the purpose of the quarter wave stub or the shorting stub, it's just a length of coax with the far end shorted tuned to two times carrier. And uh, so at carrier frequency, it represents a high impedance. At the second harmonic, it represents a very low impedance. The purpose is to give you a DC path to ground. It's a great thing for lightning protection. It's also a great thing for attenuating out of band energy. Say for example, if I, um, was uh, plugging an exciter in to uh, replace the IPA in a tube rig and uh, the tube final shorts and a lot of current comes back. Well, a shorting stub will be the difference between that current getting shunted to ground and that current getting shunted through my amplifier and blowing up a transmitter or your, uh, your exciter. So they're useful in that regard. And like I say, if you go to our website under the, uh, under the support tab and, uh, Shout out, I don't know if he's still listening, but John Wilton, the, the guy that runs the support department was on earlier and uh, he's uh, done a great job at coordinating a, a support section that's got a lot of uh, useful information in it. So uh, I tell him I'm the first growl when things aren't going my way. So, you know, it's only fair that I give him the shout out when I see things that are awesome. And uh, that's something that they put a lot of work into. But uh, again, go in there, you'll find the tips article on uh, how to uh, build a shorting stuff. All right, looks like I did hit the top of the hour. So resources, we've got a bunch of them. This webinar will be archived. You can get to it through the resources tab on our website. Again, Mr. Disembodied Voice, Ed Sylvester is the, the genius at getting that done within a day or so. If it was up to me, it'd be weeks. And uh, you know, you can certainly find these things on our YouTube page as well on our uh, on, on that channel. If any other questions, by all means, reach out to me. But on that note, folks, I want to thank you very much for spending some time. Uh, as I say, this was uh, putting this together was a learning experience for me and a refresher and a lot of things that I haven't had to rack brains on for, for several decades. So uh, I appreciate you all making me uh, keep my own self sharp a little bit. On that note, thank you very much. I will give you the heads up. The next webinar is scheduled for August 1st. It looks like I might be on an airplane on August 1st, so there's a possibility that one will get moved, but uh, we'll let you know for sure once, once I know. 
And uh, if I can move that plane ticket a day earlier, we may just do it. And I'll just uh, be doing it from a hotel in Austin. Anybody in Texas, I'm coming down for TAB. We'll see you then. All right. On that note, folks, thank you very much. Have a wonderful week. See you. Bye now.